This is Dr. Chad Johnson. Welcome to the IVF portion of the laboratory section. We would like to introduce you to some of our staff. As you can see, we have uh, Dr. Steve Vocal and Claudia Jenkins, both our Director of Research and our Technical Supervisor, as well as a large staff of very professional, highly trained folks. We have over 60 years experience just in the IVF lab alone and going in well above that for the entire staff. The IVF lab is not unlike several other labs that you may be familiar with in terms of microbiology or blood processing labs. However, it has a lot of very specialized equipment. As you can see here from the IVF retrieval hood, we have incubators flanking a hood that has an area that we work in when we process eggs, embryos, and sperm. In that hood is a microscope as well as a low and high power microscope. What's different about this equipment is that the surface is completely warm for all the eggs and sperm and embryos. Eggs, embryos, and sperm are all sensitive to cold shock, so all the processes we perform are done at body temperature. In the next slide where you see the inside of an incubator, what you're seeing is the embryos and eggs home away from home. Here we have stainless steel line shelf with inner glass door as well as an outer protective door. What the incubator does is maintain body temperature and it maintains the proper pH of the culture media, basically making it home away from home for the embryo. Now after the eggs are retrieved, you see from the following picture, the oocytes are spherical looking bodies surrounded by thousands of cells called cumulus cells and corona cells. In the following picture then we see a germinal vesicle stage egg that egg is an immature egg, and that would not be available to be used for fertilization. It would have to go through a maturation process. The next picture you see here is the metaphase 2 stage egg, which is a mature egg. You can see that there is a structure just around 630 on that particular egg that is a little blip called a polar body. That polar body lets us know that that is a fully mature egg. Now, in getting sperm and egg together, we have several ways and methods of which we can inseminate or inject the eggs. The two main processes are conventional insemination and intracytoplasmic sperm injection, also referred to as ICSI. Conventional insemination is used routinely when sperm counts are high enough or there has been previous pregnancy achieved in a recent fashion. ICSI is reserved for men with exceedingly low sperm counts or who have had reproductive surgery and there's a high chance of not fertilizing in a conventional fashion. ICSI is used routinely in men with very low sperm counts and is also used in men with repeat failure to fertilize or men who have never established a pregnancy. Now in the first video clip what you're seeing is sperm swimming around the egg at low power and you can see thousands of sperm surrounding this egg. The next slide where we go to high power you can actually see the sperm approaching the egg and usually within one hour of adding the sperm to the eggs the sperm usually find the egg and do the fertilization. The next picture we see an ICSI set up and that's where we have the equipment that we need to directly inject the sperm into the egg. What you're seeing here is a high powered microscope flanked by hydraulic systems that allow us to take coarse hand movements and reduce them to micro hand movements using the glass needles that we use to inject the egg. This next video is of sperm being picked up individually by the ICSI needle and what you'll see is that the sperm have to be immobilized and then are aspirated into the needle and picked up for the ICSI procedure. The next slide is a quiz. What's that large object on the left and what's the small object on the right? On the left is the very tip of a straight pin. On the right is an ICSI needle. This slide is demonstrated to give you some idea of the size of the ICSI equipment that we are using. The next slide shows ICSI being performed. What you're seeing is the sperm already loaded into the needle, the needle being brought up to the egg, and then the egg is penetrated. At that point then, there is a backward suction placed on the needle, so the contents of the egg are then aspirated into the needle along with the sperm, it is then gently injected into the egg. The needle is removed and then the egg is considered to be injected, but not yet fertilized. Within 18 hours of either conventional insemination or the ICSI process, we should see normal fertilization in most of the eggs. We expect about 70 to 80% of the eggs to fertilize. What you're seeing in this slide is a normal fertilized egg. The two structures in the center are called pronuclei, and there should only be two. In the next slide, we see three pronuclei. This is a sperm that underwent conventional insemination and had two sperm penetrate the egg instead of one. In this case, and in all cases of triploid fertilization, these eggs are not used because they have one and a half sets of DNA instead of just one single set. In the next slide we show is a schematic of embryo development. Normally we expect a 2PN egg to then become a 2-cell and 4-cell embryo within 24 hours. Within 48 hours we expect it to be an 8-cell embryo, as seen on the bottom. Two days following that, we expect the embryos to reach the blastocyst stage. Now from the 8-cell stage to the blastocyst stage, the embryos go from 8 cells to about 150 cells. In that 48 hour period, the embryos undergo a great amount of growth. Embryo selection is discussed because we want to know how many embryos to transfer and what factors are used to determine this. Obviously, we want to optimize the pregnancy rate, but at the same time, we want to minimize the multiple rate. 
Multiple pregnancies are not desirable, and we will minimize multiple pregnancy rates whenever we get a chance. We also want to have correct embryo selection because we want to only freeze good quality embryos. Some caveats to embryo selection are that it is subjective, which means that some excellent quality embryos fail to make a pregnancy, while some very poor embryos make very cute babies. Please see our website, alandainfertility.com slash IVF slash gallery dot htm for more embryo pictures and a detailed explanation of embryo grading. Guidelines for how many embryos to transfer are in our next slide. Generally speaking, patients less than 30 receive 1 to 2 embryos. 30 to 34, 2. Patients 35 to 37 will transfer 2 to 3 embryos. Patients 38 to 40 will receive 3 to 4 embryos. Patients older than 40 can receive 4 plus embryos. And donor egg recipients frequently receive only 1 or 2 embryos. As noted at the bottom, this is always subject to patient concerns and comfort. For example, if a patient is less than 30 but has failed more than one cycle, it may be considered to put back a third embryo, but not very likely. Also, patients greater than 40 may be concerned about multiple pregnancies and may choose to only have two to three embryos transferred. Our next slide shows typical day three embryos. In the first picture, you see a grade one embryo, which has very symmetrical cells or blastomeres. The grade two embryo has symmetrical blastomeres or cells, but also has some fragmentation, whereas the grade three embryo, the lowest of the three that are shown here, has the least symmetrical blastomeres and is also somewhat fragmented. Now that doesn't mean that the grade 3 embryo will make an abnormal pregnancy, it's just slightly less likely to make a pregnancy than the grade 1 or grade 2. In the next slide, you'll see blastocyst stage embryos. These embryos are two days more advanced than the previous slide. The embryos have grown quite a bit in these last two days, going from 8 cells to greater than 100 cells. If you'll notice in the picture on the right where we point out the ICM, it stands for inner cell mass, that's the section of the embryo that will make up the fetus or the baby, and the other side, the trophectoderm, are what makes up the placenta. So even by day 5, embryos have started to become differentiated. In summary, we try to use patient age to guide the selection of embryos for transfer. Embryo quality is very important, but it is subjective. Patient comfort level is always discussed in detail at the time of the transfer, and sometimes discussions can go on for as much as a half hour to make sure that patients are comfortable with their decision on how many embryos to transfer. We have two main goals. We want to maximize pregnancy rates, and we want to minimize multiple rates. In the next slide, we talk about embryo cryopreservation or embryo freezing. When extra embryos are available, we freeze most at the blastocyst stage. We have found that stage to be the most hardy and produce the most pregnancies. Embryos can be frozen indefinitely. However, only about 35% of patients have embryos frozen, and that's important to remember that no matter how many embryos you start with, frequently only three or four out of 10 patients have embryos frozen. Next, we want to talk a little bit about new technologies. Here we want to discuss laser-assisted hatching and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. One of our newest technologies is the use of lasers. Laser-assisted hatching is performed by using a microlaser to bore a small hole in the side of an embryo. The next slide will be of that embryo being assisted hatched or laser hatched. After that slide, you'll see pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. With PGD, as it's known, we can remove a single cell from an embryo, have that cell diagnosed for genetic disease, and then only transfer the healthy embryos. In doing so, we can try to transfer only diagnosed clear embryos, thereby bypassing the disease traits that were inherited by the parents. All of these technologies that we've talked about today are all here at ACRM in order to achieve healthy pregnancies and healthy babies for you.